Hello and welcome to another episode of Second Hand Stories. This is a place where I tell you stories. What kind? Well, histories, mysteries and unbelievable stories. Today's story is a crime story. It has a lot of adventure, a lot of action, thrills, but it also has a huge slice of warmth. You'll find out at the end. So, here's how it goes. Our story begins with a taxi driver. He is 74 year old Vietnamese man called Long Ma. He is a Vietnamese man who drives his taxi in America. And the taxi he drives is a beat up Honda Civic. Now, Long Ma used to advertise his services in Vietnamese language newspapers. He barely spoke any English himself and which is why he used to seek out Vietnamese customers. And which is how on the night of 22nd January 2016, he receives a phone call. It's from a man who says that he would like Long Ma to come pick them up and drop he and his friends off to his mom's house. Long Ma realizes that this is not going to take too much time, which is why he leaves the house dressed in his pajamas. He gets into his car and drives to the location. When he drives to the location, he finds three men and immediately they strike him as being odd. Because these three men are of varying ages and they're all standing in extremely cold weather, not dressed for it. They're not wearing any winter clothes. He would realize much later that the names of these three men happen to be Bak Duong, who is 43. There's a 20-year-old man called Jonathan Tu and a 38-year-old man called Hossein Nairi. Long Ma stops the car and the three men pile in and Bak Duong tells him, take us to Walmart. Now, this is odd again because it's 9.30 in the night. And Long Ma can't figure out why these three men have decided to suddenly go shopping when they had expressly told him that they wanted to be dropped home. But he's a taxi driver and he doesn't question them, takes them to Walmart. The men enter Walmart, they stay there for some time and they come back out. They get back in the cab and now they tell him, take us to another department store. This time, they want to go to Target, which is 45 minutes away. Long Ma is now frustrated, he's annoyed. And he tells him that this is not what I signed up for and I don't think I want to go here. At which point, Bak Duang takes out a $100 note. And it goes a long way in convincing Long Ma. And so he sets off. 45 minutes later, they reach Target and the men disappear into the department store. Long Ma is left to wait in the cab in the parking lot. Time is ticking by, the night is wearing on. He gets out of the cab and he paces about his parking lot. Eventually, at 11.30, the men reappear. They're carrying bags of shopping. They get back in the car and now Bak Duong says, we'll go to my mother's house and he gives him an address. Long Ma starts following the address and as he drives, he notices that the roads are getting darker and more desolate. Eventually, Bak Duong tells him, stop here. The place where they stop, it's even more abandoned than anything else they've passed by. Then he looks in the rear view mirror and he sees Bak Duang look at one of his companions. The man hands him something and before Long Ma can do anything, he feels a gun press into his side. And then Bak Duang says in Vietnamese, he says, we need your help. It's a request that is being made of him, but it's made extremely menacing with the gun that's pressed into his side. Long Ma immediately says, take whatever you want, I will comply. But the men tell him, no, we need you to come with us. They order him outside the cab and while one man holds a gun on him, the other two pat him down to check him for weapons. When they find out that he's unarmed, they put him in the back seat. Then Hussein Nairi gets into the front seat and starts driving. The men drive to a motel. They get out and they take 
long mao with them they check into the motel room it's a small cramped room which has two beds and it's now that long ma notices that it's hussein nairi who seems to be the leader of the pack because he immediately sprawls out on one of the beds and he orders long ma to sleep in the other one accompanied by bak twang the third man jonathan tu ends up sleeping on the floor next to the door with the gun placed under his pillow now you can imagine long ma's predicament he's been abducted he doesn't know the circumstances under which he has been abducted his kidnappers are not telling him any more information and they have a gun that night he must have slept extremely uneasily his thoughts constantly on the gun that's placed under the pillow of jonathan tu but he does go to sleep and he wakes up the next morning to see that sunlight is streaming through the windows and he sees that the men are awake and bak twang has taken the remote control switched on the television and turned to the news that's when long ma finally finds out the true nature of his predicament because on the news the headlines are screaming that three men have escaped from orange county jail the names of these three men are park duang jonathan tu and hossein nairi through the news he also finds out who his kidnappers are park duang is 43 and he is a vietnamese american man he has been sent to jail because of a litany of charges he was involved in burglary he was involved in drug dealing and most recently he had gotten to an altercation with a person leading to bak duang shooting him the second on the list is jonathan tu who's 20 years old almost pimply faced and he was sent to prison because he was involved in a gang as part of this gang he found himself in a car and this car was used in a drive by shooting which led to the death of one person the third person in the list is hossein nairi and hossein nairi seems to be more dangerous than the other two the news describe him as diabolical and he's in jail because he had abducted a person suspecting that person of having a lot of money he had then tortured him and when he didn't get any of the money he left the person to die thankfully the person he had kidnapped had survived and that's how hossein nairi found himself in jail the three men had made their escape on 21st january 2016 here's how they had done it this prison escape was months in the planning over those months the three men had gathered all the tools that they required to get out they had procured power tools they had procured rope and they had procured civilian clothing then they had cut open a metal grate that existed behind their beds from the metal grates they had squeezed themselves through and then found themselves in the plumbing system of the jail in the plumbing system they started shimming up the pipes now you can imagine how claustrophobic this must have been it's dark it's dank and the only light source is the thin beam of a flashlight and they make their way upwards until they reach another metal grate which they cut and from there they are able to make their way onto the roof it was quite a moment when they reached the roof because finally this fresh free air whips into their face in the distance they can see the shining lights of the city freedom is just moments away the three men then cut the barbed wires which are on the roof put it to one side and using the ropes they scale down four stories they touch ground and they wait there are no alarms no sounds of guards nothing the men are free and there's still half an hour before sunlight so in the dark they make their way into the city we know so much about this prison escape 
because these three men didn't just escape they also vlogged it they filmed their escape on an iphone this was the most 2016 thing to ever be done these men have taken a video and not just that they've taken photos posing next to the pipes and the grates there are photos of hussein ari going can you imagine that just making a vlog going like uh, yeah it's uh, me and the boys we're trying to get out of our life imprisonment sentences tonight let's go <laughs> they've done this right and what's more they would continue to vlog their time on the run as the whole country searches for them these people are behaving like youtubers the next day they decide to hit their accomplices and friends asking for money the plan is to go to tehran where hussein nairi thinks that they are they will be safe but when they go to their friends and accomplices they are able to get very little money which is why they have to scrap that plan and they decide instead to get a vehicle but not just any vehicle they also want to abduct the driver which is how Bak Duang finds himself opening a Vietnamese newspaper and finding an advertisement of a taxi driver. That taxi driver is Long Ma. Long Ma now understands that he is in the presence of three felons who have just escaped from jail, and he must have felt his hope diminish by every second because he knows now that these men are capable of extreme. brutality and he doesn't know what's going to happen next from minute to minute there was excruciating uncertainty that day when they see themselves on the news the three men are initially ecstatic they turn to long ma and they say that's us but very soon they start realizing that the amount of media coverage they've gotten is going to prove dangerous because now that their faces are out there people will begin hunting them down the second thing they're worried about is that someone might report long ma's disappearance and they're especially worried about this point because long ma's phone has constantly been ringing now it's been ringing because customers are trying to get in touch with him so that they can book his taxi and the three men tell him to pick up the phone and lie about his whereabouts which he does diligently they want to get another vehicle just in case long ma's disappearance has been noted so they start looking for a second vehicle here's how they get it they go to craig's list and they find that there's a man who's selling his white van okay craig's list is essentially the olx of america and when they see this white van they decide that this is the perfect vehicle for them So they contact this person and they get into the Honda Civic and drive to the location. Then Bak Duang gets out, meets the man, and he asks the man if he can take this white van for a test drive. It turns out to be the longest test drive in history because he just never returns. They've now absconded with this white van, and the next thing they do is they decide to change their appearance. To do this, they walk into a salon and they each get a haircut and they change their facial hair too. When they get out of the salon, they split up. They split up into the two cars. So Hussein Nairi and Jonathan Tu, the younger of the two Vietnamese American men, get into the white van, and Bak Duang and Long Ma are left in the Honda Civic. While they're driving back. Bak Duang starts making conversation with Long Ma. He asks the 74-year-old about his life, and Long Ma, fearing for what would happen if he didn't comply, begins telling it to him. He reveals to Bak Duang that he used to be a lieutenant colonel in the South Vietnamese Army. This was the post-colonial force that had aligned with the U.S. against the communists. and he was fighting in the bitter brutal war but eventually he was captured by the communists and he was kept as a prisoner of war for seven long years there he withstands extreme brutality but he never breaks eventually he is released 
and he tries to piece his life back together but it's extremely difficult which is why he and his wife decide to emigrate to america he reaches america but he barely knows the language and he's not qualified enough for the high paying jobs which is why he shunts around from one menial job to the next his cousins have also made it to america but they came before him and they're all highly successful this comparison causes him a lot of shame and the meager money that he's making makes him feel extremely small disputes with his wife start escalating and it reaches a point where he feels that his wife does not respect him because he doesn't make enough money now instead of confronting and dealing with this situation longmar decides to up and leave which is why he left his house and the only thing he took were a few possessions and the beat up honda civic he goes to another city and he settles down in a boarding house alone and he converts his beat up honda civic into a taxi he starts advertising his services and he begins to eke out an existence as a taxi driver as park twang is listening to this he starts feeling a little sympathy for the old man and at the end of the ride he has started calling him uncle which just like in india in vietnamese too uncle is a term for endearment the next day something strange happens a new station has interviewed jonathan tews mother and sister the two women are distraught they look into the camera and they urge jonathan tew to give himself up they appeal to him saying that he is a good person and he doesn't need to do this he should hand himself over to the police on seeing this jonathan tew breaks he starts weeping Jonathan Tew is crying in front of the television and Hossein Nairi realizes that Jonathan might be breaking and he needs to change the mood in the room and he does this by suggesting that they kill Long Ma now they had been keeping the taxi driver alive so far because they had been using his id to get into motels and they had also used his account to get money that was transferred from Hussein Nairi's mother but now Hussein Nairi starts arguing that Long Ma has been slowing them down plus he's a witness and he wants to get rid of him it's at this moment that Park Duang steps forward and defends uncle he says you will not kill him a fight breaks out it's a massive scuffle but hosein nairi has been an ex marine and he was also on a wrestling team so eventually he overpowers bak duang and with some clean strikes to his jaw and his face is able to subdue him the two men disentangle now long ma so far hasn't fully understood what the fight is about because he doesn't understand the language but he can gather that the situation is tense and then he sees hosein nairi back off and stare at him menacingly and then hold up his hands and say boom boom old man he goes to sleep that night it's restless he doesn't know what's going to happen but it passes without event the next day too Long Ma is on tenter hooks. He knows that a man as dangerous as Hossein Nairi now wants him dead. That day they travel 350 miles and they rest at another motel and again nothing happens. But on the following day Hossein Nairi comes to Long Ma and he says that they are going to take him on a trip. The way he says it you can sense that something terrible is planned for long ma long ma is put in a car with jonathan tew and hosein nairi and they start driving the drive is long and it's aimless as he's going by long ma cannot shake off the feeling that his time is now numbered eventually they reach a beach and long ma feels that they're going to slit his throat and throw him into the ocean but at the beach 
Hossein Nairi's behavior changes. Suddenly, he starts behaving friendly with Longma. It's a very odd thing for him to experience. He can't understand it. Hossein Nairi is now telling him to stand and pose for photographs. They take photographs at the beach, which he will then put together in his vlog. And he sets it to the song Rocket Man by Elton John. It was truly harrowing for Long Ma and he can't make anything of it. Eventually, they put him back in the car and they drive back to the motel. And he is left to live another day. The following day, however, they switch on the news. And this time the news tells them that four or five of their associates have been caught by the cops. This starts making the atmosphere in the room extremely tense. Now they can truly feel the dragnet closing around them. And they have to make moves quickly. Which is why Jose Nairi and Jonathan Tew decide that they are going to set out to look for new number plates for their white van. And as soon as the two men are gone, Park Twang tells Long Ma that it's time for them to leave too. The two men get into the Honda Civic and Long Ma can tell that something is different because Park Twang lets him drive. Long Ma is driving and that's when Bak Tuang tells him, don't be afraid, nothing is going to happen to you. But Long Ma doesn't take this at face value because Bak Tuang was the same man who a few days back had shoved a gun into his ribs. He doesn't know if he can fully trust him yet. But that all changes. As they're driving, Bak Tuang starts opening up to Long Ma about his life. He starts telling him about how he got into this predicament in the first place. He says this, he says that it was a dependency on drugs and certain mental disorders that had pushed him into a life of desperation, which eventually led him to make worse and worse choices. All these choices were his and his alone, but they had left him in a terrible place. He was left outside of society, unable to get back in. His parents had disowned him. His father refused to talk to him and his mother was ashamed. It was his terrible decisions that had left him without love and without his family, completely isolated and alone. And as Long Ma hears this, he can see a new picture forming. He knew Bak Tuang as a person with a charge sheet, with extreme brutality one after the other. But over the last six days, and especially now, a new composite is forming. In front of him is a man who is extremely flawed, but yet compassionate. And as Bak Tuang talks, he starts weeping. He's crying in this car. And Long Ma doesn't say a word. But this time, it's not out of fear, but out of love. He can sense that this is a man who just wants to get all of this off his chest. Eventually, Bak Tuang will also tell him this. He will tell him that Hossein Nairi absolutely intended to get rid of him. He was a witness that Hussein Nairi could not have afforded to keep alive. The plan was to kill him and throw him into the ocean. But for one reason or the other, Hossein Nairi had chosen not to do it. And which is why Bak Tuang, fearing for his life and uncle's, had decided to make a run for it while he could. At this point, imagine what it must be like to be Long Ma. You're in a car with an escaped felon who has just told you about your near miss with death. It must have been overwhelming. It must have been crushing. It must have been extremely, extremely frightening. And yet somehow, Long Ma gets the courage to tell this man I think you should turn yourself in. The suggestion is not taken badly by Bak Tuang. It washes over him and he soaks it in. And then he says something extremely, extremely strange. He says, I don't want to call you uncle anymore. I want to call you father. And Long Ma considers it and he says, you can call me father and I'll call you son. And with that, Bak Duang directs them to an auto repair shop that's owned by his friend. They stop there, he gets out and he calls the cops. 
this moment would later be described by Hossein Nairi as follows. He said that Bak Duang is the first person in history to try to collect the reward on himself. The two remaining felons, Hussein Nairi and Jonathan Dew, would run from the law for one more day. They would evade capture for one more day. And in that day, they went to San Francisco and they went to tourist spots. They then vlogged themselves smoking weed and eating bananas in their white van. And then they were caught. The way they were caught is another extremely heartwarming twist in this tale. Here's how it happened. There was a homeless man who had been keeping up with the news. He had heard of the escape of these three men and he knew that they were driving a white van. And when he saw a white van pull up in front of a McDonald's, he was alert. He saw Hussein Nairi get out and enter the McDonald's and he followed him. When he saw that Hussein Nairi closely resembled the men on TV, he immediately flagged a patrol car and led them to the two men. Because he had provided the tip that led to their arrest, he was rewarded with a hundred thousand dollars. With this money, he said that he was going to start a new life and help out his two sons who were also facing tough times. But the story doesn't end there. Park Duang is taken to prison and Long Ma started a very unlikely friendship with him. The two men stayed in touch with Long Ma sending him uh, books on Buddhism to help him with his guilt. Not only that, they spoke on the phone and though money was extremely tight for Long Ma, he still took some of it out and deposited it into the bank account of Bak Duang. This unlikely friendship probably sprung from the fact that both these men were lonely outsiders who were just looking for companionship. And I say this because after six days of being kidnapped, when Longmar returned to his boarding house, he realized that he had been abducted for six days and no one had reported him gone. The two men met in prison and when they met both of them wept they spoke about the time they had spent together and they relived these memories although these memories caused both men and Longma more than Bak Duang extreme pain and sometimes waves of anxiety at the end of this meeting they parted and Bak Duang still calls him father so that's the story of Long Ma and his incredible kidnapping. So that's the story. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then please leave a like and a comment. If there are other stories you'd like me to cover, then also leave them in the comments section below. And if you'd like to come for the live taping of all these stories, yes, these stories are performed in front of a live audience. And if you'd like to be a part of them, then do consider becoming a member of this channel. That's about it. Until next time, stay safe and bye-bye.